Almost every one of us enjoys grabbing our coffee from Starbucks whenever we're around their store. The famous Starbucks had a humble beginning as a simple store in 1971 near the historic Pike Place Market in Seattle. Since then, the business has expanded steadily. But the interesting part is that its name, Starbucks, was taken from a character in Herbin Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick. You're watching the YouTube channel Big Company Business. In today's video, we will talk about how Starbucks came into being and will discuss its journey from a simple coffee shop to a chain of 33,833 Starbucks stores in 80 countries. So make sure to watch the video till the end. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you won't miss any future videos we upload. Well, it was in 1971 when three coffee and tea lovers, Jerry Baldwin, Gordon Bowker, and Zev Siegel, opened their first store near the historic Pike Place Market in Seattle. The founders of Starbucks drew a significant source of inspiration and ideas from Alfred Peet, who was an entrepreneur in the coffee roasting industry. He was a Dutch immigrant who, in the 1950s, began supplying the United States with high-quality Arabica coffees that he had brought with him. In 1966, he founded a little shop in Berkeley, California, called Peet's Coffee and Tea. The shop specialized in importing high-quality coffees and teas from all over the world. Pete's success encouraged the founders of Starbucks to base their business model on the sale of high-quality coffee beans and equipment, and Pete's became the initial supplier of green coffee beans to Starbucks. After that, the partners bought an old roaster from Holland, and Baldwin and Bowker started experimenting with the roasting methods created by Alfred Pete to create their own unique mixes and flavors of coffee. At the beginning of the 1980s, Starbucks had already built four locations in the city of Seattle each of which distinguished itself from its rivals by offering freshly roasted coffee of exceptional quality. In 1980, Siegel made the decision to pursue other interests and parted ways with the two surviving partners. Baldwin then took over as president of the firm after Siegel's departure. In 1981, while working as a sales representative for the Swedish company Hammerplast, which manufactured kitchen equipment and housewares, and from which Starbucks purchased drip coffee makers, Howard Schultz, noticed how large the company's orders were, which prompted him to pay the company a visit. This was the beginning of Howard Schultz's involvement with Starbucks. Because Schultz was so moved by the experience, he made the decision to seek a job at Starbucks, and the company ultimately recruited him in 1982 to serve as the head of marketing. Schultz saw that first-time customers sometimes felt anxious in the stores due to their lack of understanding of excellent coffee. So he worked with store personnel on building customer-friendly sales abilities and prepared booklets that made it easier for consumers to learn about the company's products. Are you enjoying this video? If so, remember to subscribe to our channel, but let's keep going. In the spring of 1983, Starbucks dispatched Howard Schultz to Milan so that he could participate in an international housewares exhibition. While in Italy, he was blown away by the country's coffee houses and was surprised to learn that the city of Milan alone had 1,500 coffee shops. He was moved to consider implementing something like that at Starbucks, where he worked, and envisioned using fast shop development to transform the company from a modest, regional operation into a nationwide network of coffee houses. However, Baldwin and Bowker were not enthused about Schultz's plan, as they did not want Starbucks to depart too much from its conventional style of doing business. Schultz's idea was rejected by Baldwin and Bowker. They advocated for Starbucks to maintain its original purpose of selling coffee and related accessories rather than morphing into a coffee shop that also offered espresso and cappuccino beverages. Schultz left Starbucks in 1985 after realizing he couldn't convince Baldwin and Bowker to adopt the cafe concept. He went on to create his own coffee chain, Journal, which became an instant hit and swiftly expanded to many locations. When Baldwin and Bowker decided to sell Starbucks in 1987, Schultz used Gironal to quickly raise money and buy the business. He unified everything under the Starbucks name and brand, committing to the cafe model while also selling coffee, brewing supplies, and other merchandise through Starbucks retail outlets. While Schultz was at the helm, the coffee shop business expanded from less than 20 locations to more than 100 in only four years. After going public in 1992, Starbucks experienced a period of rapid growth, once it expanded its shop base beyond North America in 1996, Starbucks quickly became the largest coffee house chain in the world. Approximately 2,500 Starbucks stores had opened in 12 countries by the end of the decade. In 2000, 
Schultz stated that he would be stepping down as CEO, but would continue his role as chairman. More than 15,000 stores had been opened by 2007, but the network was faltering. Schultz returned as CEO in January 2008. He oversaw the closure of 900 outlets and launched an aggressive plan to acquire fresh development opportunities, including the purchase of a bakery chain and the producers of a coffee brewing system, as well as the launch of an instant coffee brand. In addition, he coordinated the introduction of new food items to the Starbucks menu, as the chain first started serving food in its cafes in 2003. By 2012, Starbucks' financial situation had improved because of these measures. In 2017, Schultz stepped aside from his position as CEO once more, and Kevin Johnson took over. Until 2018, when he was succeeded as executive chairman by Myron Ullman, Schultz remained actively involved in the firm. In 2019, the biggest Starbucks, a Starbucks Reserve Roastery, debuted in Chicago. Starbucks also collaborates with a variety of voluntary groups to help the farming communities with initiatives that promote economic and social development. When coffee prices dropped to historic lows in 2019, the corporation helped its growers in Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Mexico by providing loans and relief payments. Additionally, in 2021, the firm had established 10 farmer assistance centers to disseminate open source agronomic approaches to farmers in coffee growing regions. Since it started in Costa Rica in 2004, the program has taught more than 200,000 farmers. But at the same time, Starbucks is dealing with its own set of difficulties. Significantly, despite the company's best efforts to prevent it, workers at a few of its outlets began organizing unions. Further, revenues were hurt because of the COVID-19 pandemic and associated supply chain problems, notably in China, which is one of the company's primary customers. Johnson left the company suddenly in 2022, prompting Schultz to take over as temporary CEO. Starbucks said that Laxman Narasimhan had been hired to take over from Schultz in 2023. Well, that was all for today. What do you think of Starbucks? Do you visit them often? Tell us in the comment section below. Big Company Business will be back next week. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, share, and subscribe to our channel, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss anything. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next one.